Good morning, everyone. We're going to begin our time of worship, so if you'd like to join me in the stand, that would be awesome.
Palm Sunday this morning, so as we've just been singing, Hosanna, save us, Lord, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. As we continue to worship, let's really welcome Jesus, the King of Kings, into this place, just as 2,000 years ago, people were welcoming him into the city of Jerusalem. So let's say hallelujah, praise the Lord, and really encourage you to um, just focus on that with joy this morning as we continue to worship.
dedicate um, Penelope, uh, Sharifi, and uh, we're going to invite them up in a moment. Um, Penelope, I'm told, is a diva, uh, so uh, she's going to give a lot of attitude to when we come and thank God for her life. We're not baptizing Penelope. To baptize means to uh, immerse in water because someone's decided to say yes to Jesus. Now, next Sunday, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, whatever you want to call it, we're going to be gathering together and we're going to have people being baptized. It's going to be an amazing time. We really want to welcome you. We'll be all in together, etc. Now, in a moment, as I said, Penelope's going to come up. But Penelope's, as they grow up, they become like my daughter. Oh, Dad, I'm going to owe you a pound. Do you know, I'm told that it takes £100,000 to bring up one of these. Okay? <laughs> But someone decided that actually he was going to take on the burden, and so Sam asked her to marry her last Saturday, and she said yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sam, wherever you are. I'm eternally grateful. Okay, let's have the Sharifi family up in a moment. Come on up. Come on, team. I don't know whether it's a laughter, a wail, a cry, or think it. Anyway, come on up. This is the coolest family ever. Okay. Hey, team. Hiya. All right, I'm going to read some scriptures. The scriptures are here, which are truth. So if you forget everything else that happens through the course of the day, Remember that the word of God is truth to be applied to our lives. One of the scriptures says this, 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be put upon your hearts, impressed upon them your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you go for a walk, when you drive in your new car, wherever you may be. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you become like one of these, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like a child is the bravest in the kingdom of heaven. People were a little, were bringing little children to uh, Jesus to have him touch them. And the disciples rebuked them and said, get away. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I'm going to ask them a couple of questions. Hopefully they'll say yes. And then we're going to go into the danger zone. But we're going to do the danger zone of when uh, young Penelope is handed over to me. We're going to come down, actually, into the middle. And kids, if you're under 10 or 11, I want you to come and help me. Okay? So uh, if you're older kids and you want to come and help me, that's fine. All right, you two. Hey, Noah. You're looking cool, mate. This is about your sister. You can say yes to mum and dad if you need to. Anna and Abby. Do you thank God for your child Penelope? Do you accept the joys and duties of promise of uh, a parenthood promising to give her love, care, and to show her and lead her to know the Lord? Good. Do you pray and promise to bring up Penelope in the family of God, wherever that may be, to share your faith with her? Good. That's great. Now. We're going to go downstairs. We haven't done this before, but we're going to go downstairs. You see, whichever way you go that way, and I'll go this way. You see, one of the most important things that as we, as a church, want to live our lives well for Jesus, being family is one of our really important values. And it doesn't matter whether you're an individual or whether you belong to a, a human massive family, but being family here is really, really important. And so come on down, guys. Come down this way. If you're little... Or if you want to gather around this team, are there any little ones here that can come and help me? Yeah, come on over. Come on. Come and stand with me. I'm not that bad. Thank you. High five. Oh, bunch five. Fantastic. All right, where's the rest of them? Okay, here they come. So Noah, this is your tribe. They're coming around to gather around you. They're behind you and before you. This is part of your team. All right, now, this, this priometer is just about to go up. We're going to pray for little Penelope. Now, Penelope means weaver, and I thought, oh, that's very interesting. But then she's got another name, which is Penelope Grace, the maker of grace. And uh, Jesus says, well, Paul records in Ephesians, doesn't he, that the greatest gift is grace which comes from God. Now, you've also got another family that's part of your family here. You part of a life group and they're dotted around everywhere. So, Penelope, let's do this. <laughs> right, everybody, eyes down. Let's pray whilst we're winning. <laughs> Father, thank you for this bundle. Thank you that you love her and you know her and you knew her before she was born. We are so grateful for that. Thank you for Anna and Nabi and Noah. Lord, bless them and help them as they seek to be parents, as they seek to follow you. And the Lord bless you and keep you. And cause his face to shine upon you. Yeah. Let me just hold you up. There you are. God loves you, mate. <laughs> Shall I give you back? There's even tears, and that's just rotten, isn't it? There you are. <laughs> Guys, go 
Greg. I'm just going to pray for Noah as well. So if you stand around with little Noah, he's in front of you, that's great. I'm going to pray for Noah. Yeah. I'll pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for Noah, but he's Penelope's big brother. We thank you for who he is, that you love him, and that we love him too. And we ask that you'd help him, especially when she cries. Amen. Let's <coughs> give him a little round of applause. It's great to be. F- it's it's great to be family, isn't it? Um, I wonder if you'd like to say hello to somebody near you. No, why not say hello to somebody who's not near you? In fact, somebody you don't really know. Would you do that and make it really feel like family for everybody today to find somebody you don't know? That that means you've probably got to get up and move around. That's challenging. That includes you guys up there. You've got steps to go up and down. Okay, that's quite enough of being family. Okay, quite enough. Okay, can I remind you, this week, you know already it's a very special week for us as we uh, follow that last week of Jesus' time on earth when he was leading up to the cross. And also, Rogers told us about next Sunday, which is the Hallelujah Day, yeah? And if you want to be baptized and haven't been baptized, great opportunity and what a day to get baptized on. So come and see Roger or myself afterwards and we'll be so glad to get you lined up for that next Sunday. Now, a couple of other things. This is a week of prayer. We're making it a special week of prayer. So we have two particular occasions for prayer this week. The prayer room is open all week. And you can come along at any time during the daytime hours and evening hours to pray there. Hopefully life groups will be doing that through the week. But Thursday evening particularly, we're meeting as church at 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock for prayer and taking communion together. And then also on Friday morning, we'll be meeting on Good Friday morning here at 10.30. So make a special effort this week to find time personally to add some prayer time in as well. Really... Come before God and bring him your thanks for what he gave for us on that Good Friday. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your provision. We thank you that you are our saviour. Thank you that you saved us, you are saving us, and you will save us. Thank you, Lord, for that eternal gift you've given us. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue to worship. Thanks, Josh and Tess. They're going to lead us now, and we're going to take and give our offerings as worship to him as well. Amen.
just sense the Spirit wants us to push the pause button there. In the midst of God's presence, the Spirit's presence this morning, in our praise and worship, have you helped, felt your heart being drawn? There was a very, very serious prayer we just sang. And for someone this morning, you are praying. And you, this is a moment to emphasize that prayer. Heal my heart. Heal my heart and make it clean. And the Lord is here by his spirit this morning to whisper to you, I can, and I will. I can, and I will. Just take a moment. Spirit comes to just say quietly to you, my child, in my presence, you are whole. In my presence, you are clean. In my presence, you are righteous. You are good. You are accepted. Your mind. Thank you, Lord. Say it with me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's be. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I will. The fountain I do fall.
Thank you, Lord. We we are gathered here today to give you all of our worship, to say you are worthy. You are the worthy one. You are the righteous one. You are good. You are faithful. You are loving. You are kind. You are holy. You are just. You are worthy of all that we have. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. You are so worthy. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Please take your seats, folks. Good morning, friends. How are you all today? Um, a few years ago, I was sorting out the loft in, well, I say sorting out. I was rummaging around in the loft in my parents' house. And um, I don't know if you've ever done that. You find all sorts of things there, don't you? 
You know, I think Michael McIntyre's got a great sketch about all the things that you can find in, in your loft. And then um, this was no exception for me. And one of the things that I just got sidetracked for hours with was going through all of my old school books. Have you ever done that? You know, this is from like 20, 30 years ago, going through, through uh, all of my old school books, the exercise books, the textbooks, work that I'd done. I don't know why we'd kept this stuff, uh, but we had. And then um, one of the things I found that I had an old RE book, an old uh, religious education exercise book, and it must have been from when I was in year seven or eight, so I was, I, you know, 11 or 12 years old. And I was thumbing through this book, and I found it really interesting to look back into the mind of 11-year-old Timmy. And, um, and one of the things that I found that we had to do there is our teacher, our RE teacher, had given us the task, the homework task, uh, draw a picture of God. Draw a picture of you of God. And as I'm looking back now with, you know, a few years of Bible college and uh, whatnot, I'm thinking, how do you give that kind of homework assignment to a 10-year-old? You know, I mean, some of the greatest minds in the whole of history have been stumped with the question of what God is like and who is God. But here, here was this teacher giving the assignment to a class of 11-year-olds, what is God like, and draw a picture of him. And so there in my exercise book was a picture of a torch because I knew that God was light. And so there was a picture of torch, and uh, underneath that picture I'd written these words, the 11-year-old Tim had written these words, powered by Duracell because it lasts three times longer. <laughs> that was what my mind came up with. Isn't it true, though? I mean, you know, I've been a Christian for some years, and it's still difficult for us to understand, I think, what is God like? What is he actually like? And we use big words. God is eternal. God is everlasting. Well, what on earth does that mean, right? I mean, he was before the beginning, but what was before that? And no, God was before that, but hang on. And our minds, it's hard for us to comprehend what God is like. So whether you've been a Christian for many, many years, or whether you're here this morning, you're just exploring, what is this whole Christianity? What is God like? I want us to think about that question this morning. How do we know what God is like? And to do that, to try and answer that question, we're going to think about Jesus. Because Jesus reveals God. Jesus is a revelation of who God is. Jesus said in John chapter 14, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is a revelation of God. So we're going to talk about Jesus. And we, we're going to talk about Jesus Christ. And you may have heard this uh, before. We talk about Jesus Christ. And think, well, what is Christ? Was Christ his surname? You know, did he have a brother, James Christ? Um, actually, Jesus is his given name. Jesus means Joshua, comes from the word Joshua. Christ is from the Hebrew word Messiah. And that means, literally that means anointed one. To be anointed is to be chosen for a purpose, to be set aside for a, a specific role. So Jesus Christ is Jesus, the anointed one, the one who is set aside for a purpose. And theologians throughout the ages have wrestled with, well, what does it mean for Jesus to be anointed? What was he chosen for? What does it mean that he was set aside for a purpose? And they're reflecting on that, and they reflected on the fact that in the Old Testament, people were anointed, they were set aside for the specific roles, they were chosen by God for the specific roles of either a king to lead the people, a priest to mediate or to represent God to the people, or a prophet to speak on behalf of God or to reveal God to the people. And so this week and our two services next week on the Friday and the Sunday, we're going to be thinking about Jesus Christ as prophet, priest, and king. Not that those roles that he takes are separate or distinct. He's one person with one job, anointed to be the Messiah, but I think that they are helpful lenses through which we can see who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Does that make sense? So this week and next week, we're going to be thinking about Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. And today, we're going to start that off with Jesus as the prophet, thinking about what does it mean for Jesus to be a prophet? How do we view his work and his person in terms of Jesus as the prophet? Today is Palm Sunday, and as Jesus, those 2,000 years ago, rode into Jerusalem 
on the back of a donkey, and we call it Palm Sunday because the, the crowd, they were laying down palm branches as a sign of Jesus' royalty as he's walking into Jerusalem. And they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, meaning save us. They recognize there's something special about Jesus. And of course, isn't it ironic that just a few days later, the crowd was shouting, crucify him, crucify him. How fickle uh, a crowd can be sometimes. But as Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, the crowd was saying, and it says that in in, uh, Matthew's gospel, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the prophet who has come. This is Jesus, the prophet who has come from Nazareth. The people, they recognized Jesus, and they recognized that he was a prophet, a chosen one, to do a specific role. I want us this morning to think about Uh, a a story or a a bit of a story in which Jesus is identified as a prophet, in which the crowd start to identify Jesus as a prophet and see what we can learn from that. So if you've got your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn to John chapter 6. Now, John chapter 6 is a well-known story. It's the story, in fact, apart from the resurrection of Christ, it's the only miracle that occurs in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the miracle of when Jesus fed the 5,000. And a story that many of you will know well, that with just five loaves and two fishes, Jesus fed a great multitude miraculously. But I want us just to look at some of the background, some of the context to that miraculous story. John chapter 6. I'm just going to read the first four verses. John chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Now, we're not actually going to read the story of the feeding of the 5,000, What I want you to see here is that John is very deliberately, I think, giving us some specific information, some background, some context. John is setting the scene to this feeding miracle here. And uh, he gives us some specific insights here. He says that this was around the time of the Passover, okay? And of course, the first Passover dates back to Moses when the angel of death passed over all of the Israelite firstborn children, but all of the firstborn of the Egyptian were died. And so it harks back to the time of of Moses. John also tells us here that uh, Jesus went up on a mountain, on a mountainside to pray. Uh, Sorry, on on a mountainside to, to teach the people. Now, those details might not mean too much to us today, but to the Jews in Jesus' day, they're starting to put some dots together here. They're thinking, ah, It's the time of the Passover. We're we're already thinking about Moses a little bit here. It goes back to Moses. Jesus here is up a mountain, and Moses used to go up a mountain to meet with God, and Moses provided bread from heaven, and here is Jesus, and he's providing bread miraculously from heaven. And not only that, but Moses said, because he was the greatest prophet of of, of of the Israelites, Moses said that after him would come another prophet. And so the people are starting to put these things together and saying, this man Jesus, this teacher Jesus, looks a lot like Moses. He's doing some of the things that Moses did. He's looking a lot like him. Could he be the prophet that Moses said would come after him? And so as you read further down in John chapter 6, in verse 14, it says, when the people saw the sign that he had done, They said, this is indeed the prophet who is come into the world. This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. The people are putting this together. They're seeing the teaching. They're seeing the miracles. And they're saying, is Jesus this prophet who was promised from Moses? Then Jesus, after this, he retreats to the other side of the lake with his disciples And he's reflecting on this. He's reflecting on Moses. He's reflecting on the whole provision of bread from heaven. And it's at that time where Jesus says these famous words. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. 
What I think Jesus is saying here is, I'm not just the one who feeds you physically, supernaturally, as Moses did. I am the very presence of God. I'm the very spiritual bread of life come among you. I don't just feed you physical food. I give you myself. You see, bread represents the presence of God. When Moses set up the tabernacle uh, in the wilderness, in the desert, there was a table that had the bread of presence, representing the presence of God, the the presence and the provision of God. And here is Moses saying, I'm not just feeding you physically. Sorry, here's Jesus saying, I'm not just feeding you physically. I'm giving you myself. I'm giving you my presence. The presence of God is here. Let me put this another way. The Old Testament prophets... When you read through the Old Testament prophetic books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, and so on, the prophets used to speak the words of God, and they would say it like this. They would say, thus says the Lord, and then they would deliver God's message. Jesus never said, thus says the Lord. Jesus said, I say to you. Why? Because here is the word of God dwelling, living among them. I love the way that the message version of the Bible puts this in in John chapter 1 verse 14. It says, the word, God, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And here is the bread of life, the very presence of God living with his people. Jesus is not just a prophet who delivers words of God. He is the word of God living among his people. Jesus reveals God because he is God. Anyone who has seen me, says Jesus, has seen the Father. And and at the heart of the prophetic office is a revelation of God. It is the revelation of God. Jesus revealed. To reveal is to draw back the curtains on who God is, on his heart, on his character. So people living 2,000 years ago in in, in Israel at that time, could have seen God. They could have seen God. To see Jesus was to see God. You saw the heart of God when Jesus' when, when Jesus's friend Lazarus had, had died and his sisters Mary and Martha were weeping. You saw the heart of, of God as Jesus is there weeping with them with compassion. You saw the heart of, of God where Jesus is welcoming the little children to come up to him, as we've been thinking about this morning already. You see the heart of God when, when in justice and in righteousness, Jesus is charging out the money changers in their temple because they've made it into a den of robbers. You see the heart of God when, when Jesus welcomes a, a leper, when Jesus touches a leper, a leper who had to ring a bell saying, get away from me because I'm unclean, I'm unclean. Jesus goes to this leper and he touches him. You see the heart of God because Jesus is revealing the heart of God. That's, that's part of what it means to be a prophet. And of course, you see the heart of God at the cross when Jesus laid down his life for the sake of you and for me. Jesus reveals the Father. It's not that Jesus is a prophet, not just because he spoke the words of God, but because he is the word of God. He's revealing the heart of God. And this is is what the prophetic is always supposed to be about, a revelation of the heart of God. When you look in the Old Testament, what you see is God's heart of justice, God's heart of of love revealed through the prophets. When you see Isaiah, when you see Hosea, Hosea saying, you know, using the words of God, oh my children Israel, how I, how I longed for you. I raised you like a child when you came out of slavery in Egypt. Why have you wandered away from me? You see the heartbreak of God there towards his children. That's the heart of the prophetic function. And I know, I know there's a more supernatural sense to, to prophecy, but it is at its fundamental level, the prophet reveals God. To see Jesus in those days was to see God. One of the things that, um, just to shift gears a, a little bit, when I was in Africa, one of the debates that I used to have with my students all the time was about prophets and about prophecy because many of these guys or, or, or some of these guys would, 
ride around in big cars, call the, calling themselves prophet this and prophet that, and they would say things, you know, like, this time next year you're going to have a, a, a brand new car and things like this. And they were abusing the whole gift, the gift of prophecy and what it means to be a prophet. And so the students would often ask me, well, are the prophets today? And if so, what do they look like? And this was often my response. At the broadest possible level, a prophet is one who reveals God, who shows what God is like, who shows the heart of God, who shows the character of God, who shows the actions of God. Who does that today? Whose job is that today? It's our job. It's the job of the church, the ministry of revealing God, the ministry of displaying what God is like is given today to you and to me. The ministry in the broadest possible sense. And even in a more technical sense, prophecy isn't about I'm going to tell you the future for your life. The prophecy is revealing the character and the heart of God for your life. It's our job to reveal the character of God to the world. And that is the prophetic function of the church. Turn to someone next to you and say, you are a revelation of God. You are a revelation of God. You are called to reveal the character and the nature of God. This is why one of our core values, our, our corest of core values is living life well for Jesus. Because when we live life well for Jesus, we demonstrate the heart of God to the world. When we live life well for Jesus, we show people what God is like. When we love people well, when we treat people with compassion, with faithfulness, we are showing the character of God. BCC, can we be that kind of church? Can we be the kind of church that says, I'm going to lay down my own agenda I'm going to lay down my own rights so that the character of God can be seen through my life. I'm going to put aside my own desires. I'm going to live for the sake of others. I'm going to love well for the sake of others. That we might reveal the heart and the character of God. Why? Because you are a revelation of God. You reveal his character in the way that you speak in the way that you act, in the way that you treat people. You reveal the heart and the character and the words of God. That's an important task that the church has been tasked to do. And I see it. I see it here. I see it in you. I see it for those of you who, who give up your Saturday mornings to go and, and pray for people and pray God's kingdom come. Pray for people to be healed. I see it in those of you who give up your, your weekday mornings to sit in Lifehouse and, and help people who are, are hurting or need some extra he, uh, care or attention. I see it in, in those of you who are, are fostering or those of you who have adopted. I see God's heart for the orphans and for those who are unable to look after themselves. For those of you who work in hospitals or schools or social work, I see it. I see God's heart working through you. You're a revelation of God's heart and God's character when you do that. You're a revelation of God's heart and God's character when you do that. What I want us to see today is Jesus is a revelation of God. If you want to know what God is like, we can theorize all day long. We can talk all day long about this characteristic and that characteristic of God. We can talk about his eternal nature, his all-powerfulness, but actually it finds concrete expression in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's get to know Jesus. Let's get to know Jesus. Let's, let's read our Bible so that we understand who Jesus is, what he has done, so that we might see God, so that we might worship God. And then let us start to take on board the fact that we are called to be a prophetic community. And at the broadest level, at the broadest level, that means that we are the revelation of God for the world. We reveal God. We reveal God's heart for justice, his heart of love, his heart of compassion, his heart of righteousness, and his heart of holiness. Amen? Amen. Amen.
Let's pray. As the band come to lead us in some praise as we close this morning, um, just take a moment to um, reflect on, on the word Tim's brought and uh, a response to, to God this morning in this is to, to say more, Lord. We want to be those that are our windows, channels to God's heart. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you have given us your spirit and that spirit's, thank you, Holy Spirit, that it's your heart to reveal Jesus in us and through us. Forgive us, Lord, for when we um, come against that or stand against that work in our hearts and lives. But together as your people this morning, we... We stand again to say, reveal yourself to us and reveal yourself through us to a dying world. For your glory, Lord, for your glory and for your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship.
joined by the kids and there's a lot less of them than there are of you but I'm expecting them to still be louder so you need to try and challenge that and be louder than them when they come in all right well only dad's all right is anyone else all right with that song of praise to finish and then you're welcome to join us for coffee and tea upstairs. We will dance, we will dance for your glory. We will dance, we will dance for your glory. Glory, we will dance for your glory. 
shout to adore you Every sound that we make it is for you We will dance for your glory, Lord For salvation's in this place You're the name by which we say Jesus, Jesus Let your name be lifted high as our thankful hearts now cry, Jesus, Jesus, we will dance, we will dance for your glory, we will dance, we will dance for your glory, we will dance for your glory, Lord. We will lift up a shout to adore you, every sound that we make it. For you, we will dance for your glory, Lord. For salvation, for salvation's in this place. You're the name by which we say, Jesus, Jesus. Let your name be lifted high as our thankful hearts now cry. Jesus, Jesus, lift up your head to ancient gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, the King is coming in, the King is coming in, we lift up the shout to shake the skies, lift up the cry, be glorified. The King is coming in. We will dance, we will dance for your glory. We will dance for your glory. We will dance for your glory, Lord. We will lift up a shout to adore you. Every sound that we make it is for you. We will dance for your glory. God, we sound to sing, and we're bringing our lives as an offering. We will dance for your glory, Lord. And your cross is the road that we hold up high as we tell the whole world of your love and life. We will dance for your glory, Lord. We're the people. We're the people of God. We're the song to sing. And we're bringing our life as an offering. We will dance for your glory, Lord. And you cross the road and we hold up high. As we tell the whole world of your love and life. We will dance for your glory, Lord. We will dance. For your glory, we will dance, we will dance for your glory, we will dance for your glory, Lord. We will lift up a shout to adore you. Every sound that we make is for you. We will dance for your glory, Lord. anything to know Jesus more to welcome him more into your heart we have people here or down the back for prayer 7 p.m. on Thursday here in the church and 10:30 a.m. on Friday have a blessed day everyone <laughs>